Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Desert Lady Diaries podcast, a weekly conversation with women who found their home in the Mojave Desert. I'm your host, Dawn Davis, and this is episode number 22. If you're a first-time listener, welcome. And if you're a returning listener, thank you so much for coming back. More information about the podcast and our guests can always be found at the website DesertLadyDiaries.com. This week's conversation is with Hillary Sloan. She's a photographer and a writer who moved to the desert in 2009. I first met Hillary at an artist's tea at Joshua Tree National Park, where she was discussing her photography and her project, America in Land We Trust. This past fall, Hillary spent three months in Tanzania as a photographer documenting volunteers with the youth organization Raleigh International, and she's going back for another three months next week. I'm so grateful Hillary was able to make the time on her short break to come in and tell her story. Today, I'm here with Hillary Sloan, who was a producer for print, film, and commercials for over 35 years. And then in 2009, everything in her life changed, and she moved to the desert. A chance encounter on a local desert road inspired Hillary to want to know more about the community and the people who lived in the Mojave, so she picked up her camera and began exploring and interviewing. She discovered a passion for telling stories through her writing and photography. Her photography is in galleries in Joshua Tree in Los Angeles, and some is collected by corporate clients. And in 2013, it was featured in Artist Portfolio magazine. Her writing has been featured in The High Desert Star, Luna Arcana, Palm Springs Life. And after spending three months in Tanzania last summer, she's headed back again this month. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to start where we always start. What was your very first experience in the desert? Hmm. It was way back. I'm thinking it was 1998. I started to come out here with a group of people that were doing spiritual work. So we came out every weekend. And actually, as I think of it, I came out before with with my husband at the time and camped in the park once. But I didn't know a lot about the place. Even coming out every weekend mm-hmm. for twice a month right. from like 98 on, I still didn't know the town. I didn't know the community. Just a weekend trip in and out. Exactly. Gotcha. I don't know how much you want to talk about what changed in 2009 that spurred this friend of yours to call you and say, you need to come and buy a house here. Sure, um, because I think it was the universe patting me, or more than patting me, tapping me. That. <laughs> That's what they do. The first thing that happened is my uncle had passed away, and he passed away oh, about six months before that, and I cleaned up his home and yeah. his affairs in New York. And on the last day, I, I kept thinking, my, I knew I had outgrown my life in L.A., and I had no idea what to do. Mm. So I thought maybe New York, but nothing worked. And I locked the door, left a couple of days early and flew home to a telephone call from my, I had a contract with Pizza Hut producing for them for 24 years. Wow. And my boss called me and said, we need to meet. And I had a feeling. And that next day, I, it was over. Wow. And... I don't remember what else, but there had been a couple of other big corporate clients that had, because of the economy, had faded out. Mm -hmm. And then the phone call came that a friend of mine who had this big house for people to stay there for the spiritual retreats, and he said, I think you should buy it. And I was able to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that was the big thing. I was able to, but I didn't want to. It was so foreign, the whole idea of being in the desert. So I had one more year on my lease, but I bought the house Mm -hmm. and went back and forth for a little while. And then nothing, I couldn't figure out what to do next in L.A. So it didn't make sense to stay. I just moved out. I don't think I had any other thoughts about this right just I've got this house now out in the desert I guess I just need to go be there exactly and I think it took me another six months and slowly I started to get out and and look I knew Mm. nobody well that would be my next question so you come here you finally just give up and say okay I'm coming (laughs) and then how what kind of things did you do to meet people how did you find your community here 
You know, the first thing I did was uh, sign up for a writing class. It was a one-day event that Cheryl Montel was holding. Oh, wow. And that was great. And then I met a couple of artists. Uh, but they didn't live here. Most of people that weren't here full-time. So we're still really alone. Right. And I think I probably was for about a year and a half. But I don't think it was about getting into another community of people. Right. Maybe it was just being with yourself. Exactly. Yeah. And yes, in a whole different way because of the space and the newness. And it was so unfamiliar to me as a New York LA person. Mm -hmm. So would you say that was one of your biggest challenges moving to the desert was that you were kind of in a situation where you were forced to be just with yourself 24-7? And do you remember back to that time, like, what kind of things came up for you and how you occupied your time and, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, I remember all of that. So it wasn't because of the spiritual path. It wasn't the first time I was obligated or inclined to be alone. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know anybody and I didn't have any groups or or things I could go to so I really was alone and I remember doing a lot of meditating and a mm. lot of walking I guess the big thing that started to happen because I also didn't know what career and mm. I was 60 years old so jobs were not quite easy to get no and it's a difficult place to find a job to begin with it's not really conducive to that sort of thing and everything I had built my life on, the styling, the designing, the um, film was all gone. So I had to start over. So, And I looked into going back to school. And it was just, it, at that point, didn't make sense. Too much money, too much time. So I started to make a, um, a school agenda for myself. Mm. Where, say, from 8 to 9, I walked. From 9 to 10, I read. From 10 to 11, I studied German. From 11 to 12, I had lunch and, and s wrote and did things. So I created a learning environment for myself, with myself. That's great. And then I started to take courses online. And that really worked for me. And by that point, I had also, I needed time out away from the house. Mm -hmm. And so I found the White Rock Horse Rescue. Okay. And I showed up there and started to photograph. So I was photographing, but I was also around animals, mm -hmm. which was the most healing, amazing experience. And so I met a few people there and started to make a few friends. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I guess it... It was that. It was just a series of those kinds of, of things. Encounters, right. Well, I think what's something that you've said and it demonstrated it that would be important for a lot of people to hear is that sometimes life comes along and hands you that situation. And it's for a reason. And not to distract yourself to the point where you're not paying attention to what's happening, but to really take that time then that you are being given to find yourself again, find what you are interested in again, or just be quiet with yourself and listen. And these days it's really hard to get that kind of opportunity unless something like that happens to you or you just decide that that's what you're going to do. It's very hard. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of it, so it's hard on both sides. It's hard to right. get that time. Right. And it's very hard to be alone and face yourself. Yes. Everything inside of me was screaming. <laughs> right. Exactly. No, right. Not another yes. day alone. Right. No. So the fact that you put that schedule together, I think even a lot of people that work at home have to figure that out when they, you know, move from an environment of an eight to five, nine to five sort of situation where they go into the office and they have everything where you come home and you're like, oh, oh, yeah, maybe I should do the laundry before I start working. Or you start to distract yourself from things. And by having, a, I know sometimes people look at me like, what do you mean you plan in your lunch and you plan, you know, time for this or that? Because if I don't, it's not going to happen. I'll end up distracting myself all day with stuff. And at the, at the end of the day, I feel really bad because I haven't 
accomplished what I really wanted to accomplish. So I think that's, that's great is that you gave yourself a schedule to do things and learn things and cover all the bases during the day. It was very powerful, mm-hmm. much more than I would have had realized it, or that I did realize at right. the time. There's something about it. It's just, it's not goal planning per mm-hmm. se, but it is because it changed each week. Some things just I didn't want to continue and other mm-hmm. things I did. And then it morphed. So I started writing for the High Desert Star and mm. and then I uh, joined the uh, Society of Environmental Journalists and JAWS, another organization. And so it's been morphing from one thing into the other and it's helping me mm-hmm. build right from there. So when you were doing this producing for print and film and commercials, were you a photographer then? Was that part of your repertoire or was that something that came along later? It wasn't at all. And in fact, when I went to art school way way back when, I was kind of discouraged, told I would never do it, that I didn't have the technical ability. I'm not a technical person. Mm. I'm very visual and much more artistic than technical. And so with the writing and the photography, I had a lot of struggles to keep working through. Mm. So I never did photography when I was. Mm -hmm. No, and I worked for some of the best photographers in the world. So you really don't want to pick up a camera. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I was married to a photographer. So, you know, I was around it, but I don't right. think I really learned much. I was too busy learning what I needed to know. Right. Which was design and costume and sewing and makeup and, you know, everything else. How did you get into that line of work? Oh, it was another universe. <laughs> <laughs> the universe tapping me so. That was way back, whoo, what year was that? That would have to have been around 74 or something in there. Okay. And it was another time I was kind of floundering, didn't know what I wanted to do. I'd come out of art school and art galleries and couldn't find my place. And I was living in New York with friends mm-hmm. here in California, L.A., mm-hmm. and a friend who was a um, manager mentioned styling and told me to look up this photographer and he was really tough. I mean, and I knew nothing. I didn't even come from a conventional house, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) I didn't know what curtains looked like up. (laughs) They were always in the box. (laughs) My father was reconstructing houses all the time, but I fell into it. And then again, one thing led to another. Right. And it was... Just brilliant at the time. What would you say some of your favorite parts of that that job and that career were while you were doing it? Meeting people. It's always been about people for me, which is even now with the writing and the interviewing and the right. photographing, it's people. So curiosity, people's stories, where they came from, what they're doing, why they're doing it. And just connecting with them. Having a few moments where you're you're sitting with somebody that has a life experience so different than yours. Right. Yeah. Could be a famous actor. He could be somebody who's been living on the streets. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. So when you came out to the desert to live then, was there anything about living here besides the fact that you didn't really know anybody you're spending a lot of time by yourself so were there any things in the landscape were there any animal incidents or any kind of challenges to living out here when you first came that you can remember that oh tremendous (laughs) (laughs) kind of everything but there was one before i moved when the man that was my teacher for the spiritual work. And we had gone up into the park and somehow I had gotten on top of this rock and then had climbed over to another rock, which was a bit higher. And I had to to get down. I had to jump <laughs> <Uh-oh>. backwards. <gasps> and the fear was just took me to my knees. I mean, obviously I made it. I don't remember how. And he just kept laughing at me. I mean, I think... Thanks. (laughs) Um, So 
I understood that I was going to be pushed in every mm. aspect of my life, that I was going to be challenged. And I have, I do have a relationship with my higher self or myself. It's probably the easier way to say it, that I listen to things and I'm, mm. I know when to show up places and all, if I listen. Right. And what I heard when I looked at the house, because the house was very conventional. Mm. It wasn't the way I'd describe myself. And so I resisted. There was a huge resistance. But what I heard was, it's going to make you grow. Yeah. And so everything, you know, from, from jumping backwards from the rock to living in a big house by myself and taking care of it when right. I've been used to apartments and pursuing a new career, everything made me grow. It'll do that. Yeah, because you're in a situation where it's you're either going to do it or you're not. And the choice to not is a lot worse, usually, than just to go along and, okay, I'm listening. <laughs> Push me, point me, I'll do it. And I think the harder challenge, you know, it wasn't so much living here. Although later I realized there were things that I had to get used to mm. and, and work with. But it was really the work. You know, learning how to write, learning how to mm. photograph, coming up against people who said you can't do it, you're not very good right. at this, give it up. And there wasn't so much a conscious thought as much as something in my heart said, okay, and kept going. And I think that's been the thing all along. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've uh, sold the big house and bought a little house on mm -hmm. five acres and rebuilt it. And I don't do the physical work, but I've sure. designed it. Yeah, yeah. And it is the most wonderful thing mm. I've ever experienced. Oh, that's great. And then living in Africa was pretty right. challenging. And I think living here prepared me more for that. Interesting. So let's talk about that. First, how did that opportunity come up for you <laughs> to go to Africa and for three months and photograph? Okay, well, last November, Trump won the election. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> and I thought, I got to get out of here. Not unlike many people that I know. A lot of people. Mm -hmm. And then I calmed down. But in the meantime, a few minutes after that thought, I got this email from the British Journal of Photography looking for a photogra photographer in Tanzania with a British nonprofit called Raleigh. Okay. Or Raleigh, as they pronounce it. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of made sense. Right. And so I thought about it for a week and then I signed up. Wow. And that was challenging. I mean, here I'm at my age going to live. Right. All these people. <laughs> totally different country. So what does Rally do? What is their, what is the mission of their organization? They work with youth. Okay. And they prepare them for the rest of their life. So they bring both Tanzanians and UK people in, or people from anywhere, who, whomever would like to volunteer. Mm -hmm. And they give them jobs in these villages, from building toilets to planting trees oh, wow. or um, teaching uh, business skills and giving out grants. And I had a great job because I got to go everywhere. I went from village to village with my camera. Mm. And so going from village to village and from the United States to Africa, we alluded a little bit to that living here kind of prepared you to live there, what were some of the challenges that you were facing down there in living day to day? No roads, dusty. You're driving over, although I didn't drive, but you're being driven over. Dirt roads, potholes. There are spiders and mm. and um, snakes and things you have here. Right. So you can't become too squeamish about nature you know you <laughs> dust them off make Keep sure going. That yeah. it's not poisonous you mm -hmm. learn a little about what is poisonous and right. what isn't and you do that out here too because sure. it's a challenge they're rougher you know it's rougher there there's not electricity in some of the villages mm. there are no kitchens you're cooking outside on stoves 
you're sleeping on your, in your sleeping bag on a mm-hmm. just a foam pad or foam yeah. pad or bed. We didn't have running water. You bring the water up from the well and you wash with it. And some of the places were very cold. So now that I'm under construction, it's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very prepared. Yes. <laughs> You know, meeting a lot of people with different views, particularly when I moved out here. This was very depressed out here. Mm -hmm. It's changing so much now. Mm -hmm. But economically, it was really tough. Yeah. And so you meet a lot of people that are struggling. Yeah. And there's a different conversation. You have to lose your entitlement quickly Mm -hmm. if you want to communicate with them. Right. Well, and how was that being an American in Africa with a camera. Was there some resistance on the part of some people to like, oh, I don't, what's going on? I don't want anybody taking my picture. And how did that, how did you overcome some of those scenarios? I didn't totally overcome it. So mm. of course with the kids, they knew they were gonna be fo- photographed, mm-hmm. the volunteers. And so that was fine. In the community, if you're just walking and they don't know you, they don't want you to photograph them. And they're very angry about it. Mm. And they'd yell at me if I was shooting the street and I'd try to explain that they're not in the picture. Okay. But it's different languages. They speak Swahili. And I didn't learn enough of it. Mm-hmm. And when you do get to know them and you take their picture, most of the time they pose. So one of the reasons I'm going back is because I didn't feel like I got deep enough. Well, yeah, because you, without a little bit more relationship, it's harder to do. I remember when I came um, with Pamela to the artist tea that you gave at the park um, Mm -hmm. that Sunday morning, and you were even talking about that with the photographs you'd taken here with people, and that it's so important to get to know them and talk with them because that kind of brings out sometimes a vulnerability in the photography that you wouldn't get if you didn't have those conversations or that relationship. So is that about what's going on now with you going back to Africa? Particularly for documentary photography. Mm-hmm. I mean, with street photography, you know, you, you don't know people. You never meet them. Right. You never know their name. But documentary to really get a story and to get inside kind of inside out of that story Mm -hmm. yeah you have to build relationships you have to embed in it Mm -hmm. so is that the plan are you going back with the same organization yeah it seemed they didn't have a photographer and it just kept neon lighting me (laughs) right (laughs) (laughs) now the volunteers will all be different some of the staff will be the same right and i won't be in the same villages I'll move to different villages, but the same purpose. Right. Well, I remember, I mean, you posted a lot of photos from when you were down there. And the thing that sticks out in my mind is, I think once they were okay with you taking their photo, the people were, the smiles were beautiful. And the colors of everything, you know, whether it's houses or clothing, everything was really just brilliant colors, it seemed. You know, bright reds and blues and greens. It was really bright. There was a snail that was iridescent blue. Oh, my goodness. Everything there, it, it's as if nature just gave them this to balance out the darkness of their skin colors. Mm. The ground is either this deep red. Texas has a similar red mm. dirt. But this is even more vibrant. Or some of the browns and beiges Mm -hmm. all seem to complement. And then the clothes they wear is brightly colored. Mm -hmm. There's a bird I have a picture of that just has like a green and a blue and a and yellow and he's just amazing (laughs) yeah that's great well and i'm sure you saw a lot of different birds and things that you that aren't here in the u.s there was a whole different uh gene pool down there of of all of that so i did get to go on safari for four days so that was Mm -hmm. amazing but but just driving along and seeing the monkeys I, I would yeah. get so excited. They'd laugh. <laughs> the Brits would laugh at me. Go, 
oh, we forgot about you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And at um, late at night, so I, there was a little room I got for a while, and, and late at night, nothing in Tanzania is quiet. There's so much noise. They don't have a sense of quiet that we do. So Is it like voices and music everything. and everything? Oh, okay, everything. Yeah. Everything. Dogs and I don't know what else is attacking each other, but there's screeches and and I think some of it's monkeys, but mm. that was everyone said it's the monkeys. <laughs> and I never <laughs> saw them till the last day. Oh my goodness. And they're I don't know, maybe a couple of feet tall they're right. tiny little guys with round faces Aww. and they look so mischievous mm-hmm. and adorable mm-hmm. <laughs> it's the monkeys it's the monkeys <laughs> keeping everybody up at night <laughs> oh my goodness so with all of this preparation now for going to africa and you just finished i assume over this construction on your home and oh and you're not done yet <laughs> still going okay so in all of that with all of that happening um has there been anything that you've either been reading or watching or listening to that you think is super cool and fun and worth sharing? Well, when I moved out of the big house, I packed everything. So I had a, a collection of books on conservation because the one project I'm doing is about America. And it's called In Land We Trust. And mm-hmm. it's about conservation. And, okay. And everything I packed. So I can't find my books. I, <laughs> and I had bought one I've been really looking forward to reading is Slouching Towards Bethlehem, Joan Didion. Oh, wow. Her writing is so powerful and mm. includes some things from this area, from here. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so that kind of disappeared. Right. And what, did, what am I doing? Well, right now I decided to get some more classes. So... Online, there's Creative Live and Master Classes. Okay. And they have photography and writing oh, nice. classes. Yeah, and it's called creativelive.com? Yes. Or, oh, okay. And the other one is Master Classes, so I'm take, I've taken one with Annie Leibowitz. Oh, neat. I just, that's been rolling through my Facebook feed, because they also have some for actors. Yes. So those are the ones that really usually populate, but I just recently saw the one um, with Annie Leibowitz, yeah. And there's a couple of writers, too, so oh, great. all of that's been, mm-hmm. so I've been doing more of that than anything, right. and trying to wrap everything up, because the mm-hmm. house is not done. Right, exactly. So now, today being the 3rd of January, you're leaving for Africa... The 22nd, the 22nd. So what is that, about two and a half weeks? Exactly. Oh. Right. Yeah. So I have to <laughs> finish my taxes and pack. Oh, right. Yeah. And you're going again for three months? Yes. Okay. So April-ish, you'll May be May 1st. May 1st. Okay. I took a couple of days just to kind of decompose. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. That's, that's smart. That's a smart thing to do, because it's a different, it's a totally different atmosphere even than here. So you need to debrief, I guess. Debrief. As it were. Yeah. The last time a German friend of mine met me there and we traveled, we did the safari mm-hmm. and we did Zanzibar. Oh, nice. And nicer hotels. And right. It was it was actually very tough at first to go to an expensive hotel. I imagine so. It's such a different, you know, you're laying on the mat one night in, in a sleeping bag and then in the next night you've got sheets and a and shower. And a pool, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. And... I'm so glad I did this. What you realize, most people go to these places and they never meet the people of the country. Right. Because the Tanzanians that I met at this hotel or these hotels were, you know, they're hand-picked. They're Mm -hmm. not the village people for the most. And you don't get a sense of the place through that. I mean, it's lovely. Who doesn't like it? But I would have missed... Well, right, the act, the real culture of the place. Mm-hmm. And even here, when I've traveled in the U.S., I really always try and dig into, like, the locals scene more than just go to the tourist type of things. I if think I that can. did help me here when I finally found the locals in the art galleries and the mm-hmm. art walks and uh, crossroads. And Ricochet was open at the time. Oh, okay. I yeah. don't know if you know it. It was just a well, little Well, now place. it's like a clothing store. Right. Right, yeah. Or, uh, no, ceramics. Oh, is that what's... It, it was oh, on the okay. corner. Oh, be, be, oh but be. they had both. They oh, had okay. They had clothing store. Got it. Oh, okay. So and we're, that was yeah. a wonderful place to Aww. meet locals. Well, there are so many interesting people here. And they've come... They've either 
lived here all their lives, which is an interesting story in itself of how their families got here, or like you and I, circumstance or a feeling brought them out here and now they're, you know, kind of digging in and meeting everybody and, you know, feeling at home. Particularly writing was the greatest thing, I think, for me because Mm. I'd interview people, so I met photographing and interviewing, I met cowboys and I met um, right. biologists and geologists and people involved in the desert. Because there are a lot of things about living here that just coming out here on your own you wouldn't know unless maybe you know you read some books of people that have done it and lived out here but there are, there's almost like there's these codes that are only known to the people who have lived here. And in order to find those things out, you do have to get out and kind of meet those people and talk to them. And then you discover, oh, I shouldn't be doing that, or, oh, I should be doing this, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, Exactly. Mm-hmm. Like I planted too much in my house when I got oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted color yeah. and too much water. And- right, all those things. It's just, it's a learning curve, really. Well... I thank you very much for coming and talking with me today. I've learned more about you than I knew, and I really appreciate it. Have a great trip back to Africa. I can't wait to see all the photos. (laughs) Thank you very much. If you'd like to check out Hillary's photography and writing or follow her adventures on Instagram, all of those links are on the blog page at DesertLadyDiaries.com. I'm so grateful that you took 30 minutes out of your day to learn about another amazing woman. I hope you got some insight and inspiration, and if you did, I hope you'll share that with me and the other listeners on the Desert Lady Diaries Facebook page. On January 27th, Desert Stories will be happening again at the High Desert Cultural Center. This is produced by Cheryl Montel, who I actually just interviewed today, so her episode will be coming up soon. On stage telling her story on January 27th will be Adra Jensen. She was featured in episode number four of Desert Lady Diaries. So if you're around town on the 27th and you can get a ticket because they pretty much sell out, come and hear Adra tell her story live and in person. And if you can't get a ticket and you haven't heard the episode, find episode number four and listen. Next week, I'm talking to Pat Flanagan, who grew up roaming the San Gabriel Mountains and then moved to the Mojave Desert with an interest in open spaces and nature. Pat spent some time as a science educator and more recently serves as a very active representative of her community on the Morongo Basin Municipal Advisory Council. She also provides nature walks at the local 29 Palms Inn. If you're enjoying this podcast, I hope you'll subscribe or share it with a friend or hell, do both. Thanks so much for listening.